This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Smile, the makers of PDF Pen and PDF Pen Pro. PDF editing for your Mac, iPhone, and iPad. Learn more at smilesoftware.com. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. This is part two in a two-part Mac Voices Live discussion, where we tackled a number of different topics. In the first part, we did a quick update to the Apple AirPods Max headphones sent in by a viewer and listener that I think uh, helps put the, the whole controversy surrounding those headphones in perspective. Then we tackled the questions over Google's Chrome browser, what it is installing on your Mac, and why it may be affecting your Mac's performance in a significant fashion. This time around, we start off talking about Apple hardware as a subscription service. And I think you're going to find it very interesting because the panel does not agree on all points. So with that, let's go right back into the discussion. <laughs> Another topic I wanted to bring to the table tonight, guys, um, and, and Ken Ray and I talked about this on in his in a few minutes last week, and, and there've been dis, there's been discussion about this a lot about having Apple hardware as a subscription. And not just, you know, we, we, I've, we've touched here on the show a little bit about the iPhone upgrade program that uh, some of us, at least, I'm, I think I'm in, I think David's in, I'm not yeah. sure about you two, uh, Mark and Andrew, but, you know, that's almost like a subscription service. It's, it's, it's sort of not quite exactly, but kind of. And so yeah. if Apple were to bring something like this out, um, is, it, is it a good idea for the customer and is it a good idea for Apple? as they move toward a more services oriented economy or a model. So discuss, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think I, I, it has some appeal to me, but I also have a lot of questions about how it would work. So would you restate you know, your mental model of what the service would be and how would that, how would it operate? Mark, that's, yeah. I mean, conceptually, I would think I'll, I'll throw a, a version of it out there and then we can run with it. But for a flat fee per month, you would receive an iPhone, an iPad, a watch, maybe a set of HomePods, uh, or excuse me, AirPods, maybe a HomePod. Um, who knows? At, at the right level, maybe even a Mac of some level. So, and you pay that until, you know, and you theoretically... You either contract it for a time period or you contract it for a longer time period with the option to get updates, upgrades, a la the iPhone upgrade program, right? Like right now, if I, well, we just got new iPhones, but when I when it was time for a new iPhone to come out, I had the option of trading in my old iPhone and getting a new one automatically. Mm -hmm. And with a, with a little bit of change in my payment, my monthly payment because I, I changed models this year. But if I had decided to downgrade to a much lower iPhone, I still could have, I could have probably dropped my, my price if I wanted to, uh, my subscription price or my um, program price. So, you know, that's, those are some of the questions I would have is how often does that happen? What, kind, what are we talking about? What happens when the time, the term of the, uh, of the agreement is up? Do I own the software, uh, excuse me, the hardware, or do I have to give it back automatically? More, something more like a, a car lease. So, you know, the, it's open for discussion as to what it could be and what it should be and what might be a good idea. Well, I mean, I think Apple's going to have to really determine if Apple were, were to even consider it, you know, you know, talk about the iPhone upgrade program that that's more of a financing thing than anything else. It's not really, I mean, yeah, technically, yeah, I'm renting my iPhone each year when I go ahead and upgrade it, but, which I like that convenience because I, I like to be the early adopter and get the next iPhone each, um, each, uh, each year. Uh, but it would all it all have to be in some value to Apple and being 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 a value to for a subscription service. Um, you know, when you trade, you know, their 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 trading programs for trading in uh, older products is actually getting is is actually getting better too. They're actually offering a better value on a lot of uh, lot of upgrades. I and mean, I'm seeing people turning in Mac Minis for three hundred thirty dollars for a for a machine that's only two years old. And I I think uh, someone was trading in an Apple Watch for two hundred dollars. So so that. So they have that piece of the business too, of, of trading in old equipment. So why couldn't they spin it over and have it as a, as, as a like you said, a leasing or, or a subscription type service where we would be just paying a flat monthly fee for all of our devices. And then after that year, we could decide, do we want to keep paying it or do you want to, or do we want to uh, turn them in and then upgrade them to the next model? 
So yeah, it's it's really going to all depend on 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 is it going to be of value to Apple in order for them to want to even consider it. Right, Andrew, thoughts? Um, I don't know how likely it is that Apple to do this, but I think it's it's some non-zero number. I think it could be on the books for Apple in the future. Um, I do have seen a lot of complaints from people saying that it's subscription fatigue, like a a lot of complaints about, oh, yet another app that is a subscription. But like you said, Chuck, the iPhone upgrade program, that's essentially already a subscription. And so for those of us who are all Apple anyway, software services and hardware, for, for us, I think it would make sense to have an Apple One Elite tier for something like that. And so I think the idea is interesting. I guess we're all just trying to figure out, is Apple going to do this and when or no? So I like, I don't know. Yeah. I want to welcome Frank back. I think he's got his uh, audio problems fixed. Frank, you made it. I have no idea what was going on, but uh, <laughs> listening to what you were just going on about the uh, Apple hardware, the way mine's been working the last two weeks, I'd sign up in a heartbeat. But my concern about the subscription service is, uh, is there going to eventually be a point, if every, if everybody's on this thing that they're renewing constantly every year, there's going to be a point of saturation. I I, I sort of get the feeling. It's like, what are you going to do with all these old iPhones? I know they can reuse some of it, but... Is, is there going to be more phones than people at some point? Maybe. Okay. Maybe. But, uh, but okay, so let's, uh, let's go around uh, the table here. Um, okay, so, you know, Chuck, you and Ant's probably, uh, you know, the grand version of, you know, the every, every, every Apple device with a screen. Um, we can simplify it and just look at a Mac or look at an iPhone. And, you know, as good electrical engineers who believe in superposition, we know that, you know, the overall response, we can, you know, sum up the responses of all these other individual pieces. So let's look at one piece just to make uh, analysis easy and keep everybody on the same track. And, um, you know, for instance, uh, you know, this MacBook Pro, uh, I bought it in February of this year. Uh, it replaces or you know, a MacBook Air that I last bought in September of 2011. So uh, I think there, I think there is a strong clue of you know, maybe what Apple's objective is is you know, instead of having these really lumpy long periods between device purchases, be it a Mac or an iPad, etc is to try to you know, generate more revenue in intervening years. So uh, I throw it out to somebody else. Well, isn't, okay, isn't the problem though, is everybody keeps complaining now. And, and well, I think it's just a nature of the beast is that everything is evolutionary instead of revolutionary. I think we've gone past the point of anything really being revolutionary anymore in a lot of fields. And so at this point, I see it as evolutionary. So I could see possibly having a subscription program for like maybe every three or four years. Because re- in reality, people only use what? 30, 35% of the power of their equipment? Or less, way less probably. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I'm Frank, just wondering. But, but I don't think it's it's necessarily... I mean, Andrew used an interesting term, you know, the the elite uh, version. Well, how about the yeah. triple triple elite version for the people who want, you know, the, the latest machine every year? But, you know, I think, I mean, your point is well taken. I I think there there would have to be tiers here where you would have those of us that really want and need the latest machines. And then you All would right. have the, the people that are quite happy with three or four year old machines. One of the, I think, Mark, to answer one of your questions, um, or maybe it was Frank's, I think one of the advantages here for Apple would be that we wouldn't have people running 2012 machines and 2011 and 10 machines. 
you know, because they would have an easy upgrade path and, and at least it, it's, it's a whole lot different, to, I think, to say we're, you're going to pay 30, 40, 50 bucks a month as opposed to drop, you know, 1500 to $2,000 on a, a, a piece of hardware. You know, it, it becomes a lot more palatable. And, you know, the subscription things, I mean, I don't know about you, but it's simple. I always just say, okay, what what am I going to spend in 12 months on mm-hmm. this? Do the math. Multiply, multiply by 12. Gee, that doesn't seem quite so bad then. And if I divide by or multiply by 24, it still may not seem so bad. So I'm going to go for the subscription mm-hmm. model. And, mm-hmm. you know, so th- that's it. There's so many different angles to this that I th- I think it's really intriguing as to as to what the benefit to Apple would be versus the benefit to us. You know, another thing that I just thought of, I didn't um, kind of realize it before. So we already have the iPhone upgrade program, but starting, I think it was this year, we now that we have the Apple card, Apple has introduced special financing options for, oh, yeah. I think, most or all of their products. So I guess you can kind of see that as a subscription because instead of paying so much up front, you're paying a monthly amount. And then after that, you get to keep to it. That's a really interesting point, Andrew. And if I, if I decide to sell back, as long as I get something close to the amount needed to pay off the loan or the, the, the term, you know, then that does sort of sort of turn into almost a, an upgrade program. Mm-hmm. Huh? Yeah. Well, thought about it exactly. Now, um, you know, sort of. You know, they will they will buy back, and um, you're just looking at uh, at a recent example. Uh, again, just uh, something we know and love is sort of the MacBook 16 inch MacBook Pro I have, and and Chuck has, and you know, checking to see what the Apple uh, buyback price is. Mark, we lost your uh, audio. Zoom is driving everybody crazy. Oh, okay. There it's, you go. Now you're back. Okay, am I back now? Okay, so yeah. I was just going to say as um, yeah, as a way to sort of back end into the subscription program would be, you know, I looked at uh, – what Apple's sort of buyback uh, program is now, you know, thinking, okay, you get advice, you know, sell it back and then you know, turn it over and get a new one. And, you know, for making analysis simple, I used a device that uh, Chuck and I know it's a, uh, you know, the 16 inch MacBook pro. And I have sort of, you know, one of the base config models. Uh, he has one that's, uh, that's been upgraded on uh, mem. I think memory speed as well as uh, I know SSD and uh, and DRAM, and if you sort of look at you know the initial uh, purchase price, it's uh, sort of this is the base model. You know, the initial uh, purchase price is um, <coughs> uh, excuse me, it's twenty eight hundred dollars, twenty seven ninety nine. You know the trade. You know the trade-in value is one thousand five hundred thirty. This is this is through Apple, so you know, they're basically you know paying back fifty-five percent of, um, you know what uh, the original purchase price is. Uh, looking at this a little bit deeper, it seems that you know they at least for this particular model, and I think there's some elements of this that apply to other uh, other systems they do as well. Is you know they upgrade memory and SSD and then resell it so it's at a you know, uh, you know they offer a discount at a higher you know effective uh, list price and you know by so doing you know they really you know, create a great deal that's a great margin sweetener and if anyone uh, is interested in their eyes won't glaze over I have a spreadsheet that I could show that could illustrate <laughs> this point but. Um, the point is now that sort of the hardware business, um, if Apple, it, it, it seems that at various times that uh, you know, they offer different deals and their prices are roughly analogous to what other companies like Gazelle, et cetera, have, which makes sense due to market forces, right? They're all you know, competing for uh, you know, you know, previously owned machines. 
know, and sort of just Chuck and I passing some data points back and forth uh, via Twitter earlier today. It seems that there's like maybe a two to four percent variance depending on uh, the buyer and depending on uh, if you're in excellent or good condition. If it's if it's really flawed, that you know clearly uh, prices drop out considerably. You know, so looking at this, this might be a model that appeals to what Chuck and Andrew were calling the elite class. You know, people want to have a new machine each year. We're doing this. This is this is really good business for Apple. Um, doing this, you know, trying to do a general uh, subscription where you can buy it. And if you think about modeling it after the iPhone, it's, you, know, you buy it for twenty four months. You can upgrade after uh, after twelve months. Um, that probably doesn't work for a lot of Macs. So the reason is. Apple will lose money. Uh, why? Because you know, if the gross margin is less than fifty percent, you know, since they're selling it, you know, for over a two-year term, if you can upgrade after fifty percent, you know, half the term, uh, you know, if you haven't recouped the co manufacturing costs, which they won't, if the gross margin is less than fifty percent, it just doesn't make economic sense for Apple. So. Um, this is not a simple thing to take a look at, you know, because uh, so much of this depends on you know, the manufacturing and costs and gross margin costs. Now, if all Apple is doing is you know, they take the Mac and if, you know, the, if the aluminum cases and screen and keyboard are a reasonable condition and all they're doing is um, doing a peripheral upgrade, which, you know, since these devices are soldered in, I have to assume that, you know, they, you know, there's not something they can unplug and replug in. They have to put a new motherboard in. That uh, at this point, you know, who knows what the cost of those things are? But that's why, again, it depends you know, very much on what the gross margin of the product is on, and when you know Apple would offer ability to upgrade or trade in a device. Uh, you know, iPhones are generally believed to have you know extremely high gross margin. You know, offsetting low gross margin like on entry level Mac products in their overall profitability. But um, I don't see Apple getting to a point where they would ever sell a device you know, or ever have a program under which uh, they, they're they in a position where they would lose money. And going forward, the only thing I think I could say is that as they move to their own uh, Apple Silicon, you know, they're in a much better position to control their prices, uh, as well as the modularity of their system. So that, you know, maybe it's a Mac or, you know, or other device comes back in, you know, they, they switch out, you know, a component for a CPU, a couple of components for, uh, 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 you, know, uh, you know, SSD, and off it goes. Because one, to me, one of the interesting things is, you know, on the, as, uh, on, on the M1 Max is that, Integrated in that module is, in addition to the CPU, is you know is integrated in, uh, in the DRAM for the device. So I think as they're getting more modular, they're getting to a point where they could swap out just a minor silicon component while reusing you know that you know high cost manufactured aluminum uh, case, the keyboard, you know, the high quality screen. So that uh, basically, I think uh, what we're seeing is value is switching away from you know CPU uh, into uh, you know the other uh, user interface, user tactile parts of uh, the system. So you know, there's a there's a lot of ideas there. I would say that you know coming out to summarize, coming out with a, a subscription program will depend on economics, and it all depends on you know, what Apple's costs could be. And I think that looking at some of their uh, current trade-in and refurb and resale programs uh, leads me to think that you know, unless they can boost their gross margin on you know, their devices above 50%, I don't think that uh, they you know, could do it. Confounding this is also, as we were discussing a little bit earlier on, is what is the average upgrade cycle? If it's five or seven or nine years, if they could get people to upgrade every three years, you know that could be you know, anywhere from like a forty to uh, you know sixty percent reduction in refresh rates, thus boosting their average revenue. 
your, their annual revenue, which ultimately uh, we're with free market capitalist based system would be their objective. Um, but without, with, you know, without more information, you know, we're just uh, throwing darts at a dartboard. I mean, we could have an informed discussion, but uh, you know, it's saying anything more than I think that Apple might, uh, I don't think any of us have enough information at this point in time. Mac Voices is supported by Smile, the makers of PDF Pen for iPhone and iPad. Do what you want, where you want, when you want to your PDFs on your Apple devices. Smile is at it again, making real, useful improvements to PDF Pen for iPhone and iPad. The just released version 6 has added continuous scrolling to make it easier to work with lengthy documents. Scroll smoothly across multiple pages without page breaks. And the scrolling works both horizontally and vertically, so no matter which mobile device you're on, you can be your most productive. Smile has also added an eraser tool that lets the user easily remove freehand marks drawn by the scribble tool. That can streamline the handwriting and note-taking process. If you haven't used those features, you should. Plenty of teachers do to grade homework PDFs, and that new eraser tool makes it even easier. And of course, PDF Pen for iPhone and iPad syncs documents with PDF Pen and PDF Pen Pro 12 for Mac via just about any cloud service you can think of. iCloud, Dropbox, Google Drive, Microsoft OneNote, and any other files-compatible apps. Want to find out about all the features and capabilities of PDF Pen for the Mac, iPhone, and iPad? Of course you do. Visit smilesoftware.com slash podcast today to download a free demo and see why PDF Pen should have a place on all of your Apple devices. Smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Click that link now and start doing more with your PDFs. Thanks to Smile for their support of Mac Voices. Frank, you're on mute. <laughs> oh, I'm really hitting all bases tonight. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm curious though. It's like, yeah, there, there's a definitely like Chuck was saying earlier. There's there's the tiered system would probably make most sense. I just. Yeah, people are paying just in monthly prices, but I'm wondering since Max lasts so long, I and mean, I was watching a YouTube video tonight where a guy actually had Catalina running on, I think it was a 2010. And I'm just wondering how many people, does it financially work out? Let's say if someone is on, let's say the second or third tier, and they get a new Mac every two or three years. Is that financially going to benefit them? And I, I, I think of this in, in case of, uh, compared to like cord cutting. I cord cut 10 years ago. And so I saved a lot of money for a while. But now I'm paying to Patreon for all these podcasts. I'm paying to specialty channels that I have on Apple TV. And so now... I'm back up to 80 bucks a month already. Yeah, well, but Frank, what but but what would you have paid? I mean, you're looking at it from I go back to my my annual thing. You're looking at it as 80 bucks a month and I would say to you look at what you would have paid on a, on an annual basis then and now. Because you you can look at it as oh my god, I've got an 80 80 a month bill. And it and you overlook the fact that yeah, but you paid six hundred dollars for something you know earlier in the year, and then you had no other payments, and you forget about that six hundred dollar purchase, as opposed to seeing gee that eighty dollar a month every you know ticks away and it's eating me, it's killing me, when you know guess what you spent you know a whole lot of money before. I just sort of like what uh, if I understood Mark if I understood you correctly is you would go in and just sort of like have a component replaced because I'm thinking of uh, the equivalent of, of uh, electronic vehicle, uh, electric vehicles where they're talking about you would swap the battery every so many years and they just update the software. Uh, now so something I, to that sounds feasible to me. Yeah. So what I was thinking is uh, again, that uh, looking at is you know, sort of what I, how I think some of the Apple Mac buyback programs work is, you know, they take back a Mac, you know, they upgrade peripherals and they resell at a higher price. 
So that's the model I had in mind. You know, I wasn't thinking that uh, on any of these subscription programs that uh, you know they that you know they take the unit back, you know, phone, Mac, whatever, and don't do anything with it. I think that uh, you know I think that would be an economic loser for them. You know, I think that uh, what they would do is they you know, they'd bring it back, you know, and they reuse you know, the components to the best extent they can, and then they go out and resell it in some fashion, you know, at a lower price point. And I think that addresses your point of, you know, okay, what's going to happen with all this e-waste? You know, I think, you know, it's going to, it's going to get circulated around the system instead of just dumped into a land, into, in, into a landfill. And I think, get in, I think the other reason is that I, I think, again, just stated simply, I think the reason for a subscription program is it will allow Apple to, uh, reduce the effective period between upgrades of you know, something like a Mac or a phone from five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years in the case Frank was just mentioning to something that may be you know, a three-year period or a four-year period. And we, we, can, we can debate what the period may be, but effectively what it's doing is it's increasing the volume of their you know, effective annualized sales you know, as measured by uh, recurring hardware subscription revenue. David, get in here because we haven't heard from you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I again, I just go back to the subscription, uh, the, this, like Marco just saying, I mean, you just got to, you just got to think where is Apple going to be with this, with this value? I mean, I, I just, I, it's going to be tough. I think it's going to be a tough sell to, to see if Apple is even willing to do it. Um, I think there's just going to be some, just some tough uh, tough decisions. Even Andrew mentions that you know, that's probably highly not, not very likely that Apple may even be considering this. But you know, with with bundles the way they have now, anything's possible. Um, but I just don't see it. Uh, I I I would be kind of questionable about it, honestly. I mean, I, I like what I'm doing with my iPhone upgrade program, but uh, it's going to be well, it remains it remains to be seen to what to what Apple would do. And I agree with you. I, I'm not sure the economics work out, but I'm willing to admit that I don't have all the facts, but uh, what I can see and estimate based on the economics of Intel-based Macs, I I don't think it's going to work out. I mean, you also got to look back, you know, uh, Apple's with the Apple Card. They've been very successful with the, with, with, uh, with the, with the Apple Card, with the uh, uh, Goldman Sachs and uh, they're doing financing for everybody. I mean, you could buy a Mac and get for two years. I mean, I, I think I've, I've got my, my Apple watch on a two year plan. I'm paying like 25 bucks a month or something, some really low rate. I don't even think about it. So, mm-hmm. I mean, if you look at spin it that way, you know, it, p- people have the Apple card. I mean, they're probably going to be doing it that way. Uh, and although interesting enough, I think the AirPods uh, pro uh, max, you only can get it for six months. So you're paying like 91 bucks a month for those. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> So, so, you know, so you got, you got to see it that way too. Is Apple may see it more lucrative to just let's, let's, let's focus and put the financing in on, on the Apple card versus something like this. Andrew, the one, the, the, I guess in my head, I'm thinking that though there's some other less ease, less easy to calculate if that's possible, given what Mark was saying, um, you know, this does, it, 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 it pulls you into the Apple ecosystem and it keeps you there. Unless you yep. you you know unless depending on what your buyout clause is, mm-hmm. you're not going to get frustrated and say, "Hey, I'm I'm going to jump ship," and you know then once you're in the ecosystem and you've invested in the applications and all, um, then you're more inclined to stay. If you know if if your machine gets old or if you decide to upgrade or even if you don't, you know now you've become an Apple user, and so I think there's a a, a potential huge benefit there. Yep. Yeah. Um... I don't remember, there's a term for this, I don't remember what it is, but this has been a fact of, I think of Apple for a long time where it's it's like a buy-in. You know, you buy one Apple product and you're kind of more likely to buy more Apple products just because they work so well together. Like Apple has really kind of figured this out and to keep people in their system, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, I guess it just depends on your point of view. And so I think, maybe a subscription would kind of be more likely to do that, to keep people in the ecosystem. I think the term's addiction. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there is that. 
Yeah. No, I, I listen, I think it's an interesting discussion to have um, because it, it, it sort of makes in a world where now we can, we can, we have a sort of program for our phones. We have programs for our, our cars. Um, hey, we have programs for the places we live They're You know, it's called rent and leases. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Would this be a bad thing, you know, to to do for something that is, for at least some of us, a, you know, a fairly expensive part of our lives? So, I don't know. But again, I, I think in that regard, there is you know, clear value in, you know, instead of having to shell out two thousand dollars plus for a, for a Mac Pro, if you could, if you have an entry price, you know, for one hundred and fifty dollars a month for some some term that uh, that would be more attractive to a lot of people and then at the end oh because it's only 150 dollar a month yeah i'll i'll re-up i'll get uh, I'll, I'll get the uh, you know latest uh, you know version of the same machine so by doing that that will boost apple's recurring total overall revenues because they get it in smaller pieces on a recurring basis um and it avoids the sticker shock of people say, oh, no, I can't upgrade. You know, last time it cost me $2,800 and I'm not going to do that again. That's just, you know, too damn expensive. I'm going to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. You know, and that's why they get, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine year uh, replacement cycles. So um, uh, I, I think I, I think at the heart, you know, yes, uh, as Andrew was saying, this is this is a lot about making you know, people stick within uh, the ecosystem. Uh, and upgrade, but they also want to upgrade uh, the devices more frequently because you know there is a lot of benefit to you know, running you know, the latest and greatest devices and software. You get a much better experience than if you have something that uh, maybe can just barely run a version of software. Mark, I have to admit, you said something there that that struck me that I really hadn't processed exactly the same way. Um, but I know plenty of people that drive Mercedes. Or or high higher end cars that could would never afford them if they had to lay down the cash, mm -hmm. but because they can do a lease program, uh, you know they're they're much more inclined to say yeah hey because I can I can buy myself out of the lease for even less than the cost of the car but you know I don't I don't have to put down that sticker shock kind of money up front I can just mm -hmm. you know hand them this minimal amount of money and I've got my gratification of driving this vehicle so that. And, and your other point too, and again, I hadn't thought about it exactly this, this way, that sticker shock the second time around, you know, they people either wait and wait and wait until something, you know, really happens and they can't recover from it, or they decide, hey, you know what, I've got that, that there's that cheap little thing over here that has a screen and a keyboard, I think I'll go give that a try. And, you know, inevitably, I think they, they are disappointed in the experience and come back, but you've lost them for that time period. Why wouldn't you just keep them in, in, in the stable, if you will. So, I don't know. Fun, fun discussion, guys. Fun discussion. Yeah. So, on we're the, at it. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. So, um, did anyone see uh, that movie Mank? You know, it was uh, on uh, on Netflix. You know, it came I out. I started watching it. I didn't finish, but uh, oh, there was, it looks there's this one quote in there that really struck me. That I think is apropos of this, and it's. Uh, I think it was Samuel Golden was talking about the movie business and saying the movies are the best business there is. You know. People give you their money, you give them nothing, they come in and they walk away and all they have is a memory. Wouldn't that describe perfectly a, an Apple subscription model? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sort of. Yeah, I guess. I, I hate to, to compare it to the movie industry, especially right now. But <laughs> Hey, guys, we're out of time, but thank you. This was a, this was a really good one. I hope... Uh, yeah. I hope as people listen to this, they think a little bit uh, about the implications. And, and folks, if you have thoughts, you know, please share them with us uh, on Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, contact us on Twitter. You know, it, me and me individually, or any of the team individually. And speaking of that, I'm going to go around the room and let the folks tell you where that you can find them if you want to talk to them. So I'll keep the same order, David. Uh, be, you can find me at InTouch with iOS at InTouchWithiOS.com, my podcast, uh, recording a show this week. And uh, I'm on the Mac show, and I'm also on the Mac to the Future Go livecast with uh, Guy Searle and Warren Sklar on Wednesday nights on Facebook. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at DaveG65. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Dave. Really appreciate it. Yes. Uh, Mr. Mr. Roker, uh, otherwise known as Mark Fuccio. Um <laughs> 
<laughs> Where can folks find you? Uh, you know, in the sunshine, away from the snow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, you know, so best way to you know, contact me through Twitter is at, at symbol M-A-R-K-F-U-C-C-I-O, at Mark Fuccio. And if anyone here wants uh, information about you know, how they can continue to use the Chrome browser and turn off that uh, obnoxious updating agent, uh, just uh, reach out to me on Twitter and uh, we can start a dialogue. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. Really appreciate it. And appreciate the homework you did too on this one. Thank you. Mr. Andrew Orr, where can folks find you as if we didn't know? <laughs> uh, so on Twitter, you can find me at Andrew, uh, at Andrew or not, that is O-R-N-O-T. Um, you can find all of my writings and opinions over at the Mac Observer, macobserver.com. And uh, Kelly Gumont and I, not only can you find me occasionally on our daily podcast called uh, the Mac Observer's Daily Observations, but Kelly and I do a fairly regular segment on every Friday called Security Friday, where we we talk about the security news of the week and also try to give people a practical tip of how they can improve their own security, like using a password manager, for example. Good. Very, very valuable information always. Yes. Thanks for being here. I'm glad you made it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. Do it anytime. You're always welcome. Last but absolutely not least, his mic is working. His his speakers are working. Frank, where can we find you? Uh, I'm the guest that shows up after halftime once the game is blown out. Uh, you can find me. I do a monthly article on S uh, Screencast Online Magazine. I have a blog, ympnow.com. And you can find me floating around social media at FP Tree. Great. Thanks so much, Frank. Glad you got everything worked out. And you got, even if you didn't get back at halftime, still good to have you. Yeah, well, it busted last week. We'll see how next week works. <laughs> you'll, you'll break it, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm on a string. I'm on a string. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Folks. I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices Live. This time we were on Facebook and YouTube, and we plan to be both places uh, going forward. Um, we've had uh, some people in the YouTube, uh, watching the YouTube stream. We have had people watching the Facebook stream. This is going to work out kind of nice. So uh, join us Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, next week is a holiday week, but I still plan to be here. I don't know who will be here with me, but uh, I, I hope you will join us then. And definitely uh, reach out if you have any thoughts or suggestions about the, uh, the potential subscription model. I love the idea. Until the next time, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com Bandwidth provided by CashFly at CashFly.com.